Hi, everybody. This is my talk, Things I Believe Now That I'm Old. My name is Ross Tuck. I'm an independent consultant, coach, and coder. I'm also the co-founder of a user group called Dome Code, which is for any programming language or framework anywhere. It's a lot of codes. Um, I'm a Scorpio. I like books, hats, long romantic walks on the beach. But what you probably want to know about me is how old am I? <laughs> well, I'm pleased to announce that I've reached the ripe old age of 29. <laughs> okay, so that's not that old. The title is very, very much tongue in cheek. But in my defense, I've actually been doing uh, you know, professional IT work since I was about 15, and I'm almost 30, so you know, that gives me about 14, 15 years experience in the industry. It's not enough to be a gray beard, but it's something, okay? But the main thing I've noticed about being 29 is that you're almost 30. And the main thing I've noticed about being 30 is that, right, the main thing about being 30 is that it's not so much about how many birthdays you've had, it's about how many you've got left. Okay? So with that in mind, I'd like to tell you a story about my last birthday. Okay? So I was at home cooking dinner, and my girlfriend comes in, and she says, honey, I love you. I said, that's sweet, I love you too. She goes, what do you want for your birthday this year? I was like, I don't know, I, what? I was like, I was chopping vegetables at the time. I was like, so she says to me, you know, you're, you're really, really hard to shop for. I love you, but you're hard to shop for, so just tell me what you want this year and you're getting that instead. I said, I don't know, I, I could use a new chef's knife. That's something I would actually get practical use out of. She's like, fine, you're getting that. There's only one catch. My girlfriend is a very, very smart lady, but she doesn't know anything about knives. Luckily, as it turns out, she didn't have to. You see, she's a fan of this website. You might have heard about it. It's called uh, Reddit. Any Redditors in the room? Yeah, a couple, right? So the great thing about Reddit is all these little sub-communities like Ask Culinary. And the great thing about Ask Culinary, aside from their low-res logo, is the fact that they're full of all sorts of like culinary professionals, like um, uh, people who manufacture kitchen equipment, chefs, uh, home cooks, uh, you name it, they've got it, and they're there to help you answer any question you might have. But my girlfriend didn't even have to ask her question. All she had to do was search, and she found that several people had asked the exact same question beforehand. She was able to read through several threads and make a decision about what would be the right knife for me. Then she ordered it online, and that's how I became the proud owner of a Victorian Ox Fibrox chef's knife. And I gotta tell you, if you're in the market for a new knife, it's pretty great, right? The handle is non-slip, balance is good, very sturdy, and of course, it's very, very sharp. <laughs> okay? So this leads to the question, how did my girlfriend, who, as I said, is a very smart lady, how did she come about purchasing such an awesome knife even though she didn't know anything about knives? Okay, this is way better than anything we would've got just walking into a store and picking up something off a shelf. I would argue it's because she had access to something very, very special. Advice. She was able to get advice about knives. Okay, now let me be clear about what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about raw data, like facts and sheets and tables and charts about knives. I'm not talking about, you know, random, unobjective interviews, uh, uh, reviews of knives. And I'm certainly not talking about a list of related resources that you can, you know, study and become an expert on knives. I'm talking about advice. Specific, directed recommendations for your circumstances. So, uh, in the old days, advice was very, very special. It came down from on high, from people like Dear Abby, or these days, Dan Savage. But in the old, um, but the internet has changed all that. All right? The internet has made advice um, very, very easy to obtain. These days, I can go to one website, and I can ask questions to experts in any field whatsoever. Or I can go to another website, and I can ask questions to people who aren't experts in any field whatsoever. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Bit of a cheap shot. Okay. I can find out, um, you know, where should I eat? What movie should I see? How should I do my job? Where can I go in person to get more advice? Okay. So the internet has made advice cheap to give and easy to get, which is awesome, because while I have my suspicions about some of you, I personally am not an immortal vampire. I do not have an unlimited amount of time to learn everything it is I want to know, and I have less time all the time, okay? And that's the amazing thing about advice. It is essentially distilled experience. It is a quicker way of learning something, of using a body of knowledge without having to build it up yourself. But we're developers, and fast is never fast enough. We always want to optimize. So in that spirit, 
Today, I would like to give you some advice about advice. And to illustrate my points, I would like to use actual advice I've been given. And if that makes you think, we need to go deeper. <laughs> then I'll remind you that you just saw Igor's talk, and it's called recursion, not inception. Okay? So I'm going to cover seven steps to use whenever somebody offers you a piece of advice. Okay, so let's just dive in. Step one. It may not be the most polite thing to say, but I think whenever someone gives you advice, the very first thing you should do is consider the source. Consider the person giving you the advice. I like to do this in sort of a chart or a graph. On the one axis, you have the capability of the person, like what kind of knowledge level do they have? Are they experts in the field? Many years of experience. Maybe they're just starting out or, or even maybe not so good at it. On the other axis, you have how sympathetic the person is. Are they helpful to you? Are they invested in you? or maybe even actively harmed by whatever it is you're trying to do. Now, if you're to chart somebody you know, like a lead developer, I'd put them somewhere around here. Not the most helpful, but very helpful. Lots of experience. They want you to succeed. I would put, say, a junior developer, on the other hand, somewhere around here. You know, not quite as much experience as a lead dev, but for some reason, that, that smidge more helpful. I don't know why that is about junior developers. Maybe they want to make a good impression. Maybe they haven't learned the value of saying no, but always a little bit more helpful. Now, keep in mind, this isn't about right or wrong. I'm not saying who should you ask a question to. I'm saying this is about weight. It's about the subconscious filter you put on the advice that somebody gives to you. All right? And this can be good and bad. In general, listening to your elders is good advice. People with experience, they want to stop you from making the same mistakes they did. But they're not perfect, and that's where this gets tricky. Let me tell you a story from the very, very beginning of my career. Um, I was starting this small web dev shop in this little town, and I was doing like little graphics tweaks, pulling stock photos, stuff like that. But I wanted to do more. So I saved up my money, and I went out and I bought this book. And you can laugh if you want, but it is no understatement to say that this book changed my life. This was my first introduction to you type something into a text editor, you hit save, refresh, and something else appears on the screen. And yes, maybe it was just an HTML table, but it was magical to me, and I was hooked right away. Okay, so I'd been dragging this book around with me everywhere, reading it on lunch breaks, you know, studying it, doing the exercises, and my colleagues had noticed that. And eventually, like about another month after that, they came up to me and they said, Ross, we think it's awesome that you're trying to expand your skill set, you know, do more in the company, take on more responsibility. But we think you should stop with this HTML stuff. Because Flash is the future. <laughs> okay? Now, keep in mind, all right, all right, this was the year 2000. There was a lot of crazy shit happening in IT in the year 2000, okay? So when somebody said this at the time, it seemed kind of legit. Right? Now, spoiler alert, it didn't quite turn out that way. Now, if you were to chart my colleagues on this graph again, um, genuinely helpful, genuinely had my best interests at heart, but maybe not so good at predicting the future, okay? Now, keep in mind, I'm not saying that I was any smarter than they were because I'm absolutely not the case, all right? What I did do was consider the source. That I considered the fact that when they told me something, that perhaps it was not with the broadest view, that they had worked in the same web shop for the same small town with the same management, doing the same type of projects for the same clients who wanted the same thing that their neighbor had, okay? But if I took a broader view and looked at the overall industry trends, you know, that was not where the industry was headed and perhaps my time was better invested elsewhere. So, that's a little bit sort of about the capability axis and how you might put it into practice, but it's not the only thing on this chart. What if I were to consider how helpful somebody is? Now, the good news is here, tinfoil hats aside, most people you meet want to help. Most people are good. They want you to succeed. But once in a while, you're going to get advice like, your money is safe with Goldman Sachs. <laughs> this type of thing is, genuinely, is generally given to you by people who rank very, very highly on the previous scale, experts in their field, but their interests are not your interests, and you would do well to keep that in mind. And once in a while, I hate to admit it, it's true, you're going to find somebody who just has it out for you, who just doesn't like you for some reason. Um, for example, you might know Joined In, the comment review system that we've been using here to leave feedback for the speakers. You have, right? Okay. Let me share with you an actual Joined In review I got a couple years ago. I'll read it to you. I guess I'm the only one that did not like the presentation. Way too fast, and he seems somewhat arrogant. What's up with the hat? Are you a cowboy in real life? 
Okay, so in my mind, this person strikes out on both axes. Right? First off, this is clearly not meant to be helpful. It's, it's just meant to hurt. Okay? This person does not have my best interests at heart. And secondly, I question their capability or expertise in dealing with the world if they think that this is a cowboy hat. <laughs> okay? Okay. A good friend of mine, somebody I really respect, he told me once, he said, Ross, you should be, he was, he was really drunk at the time, he said, you should be m more of a shark. I was like, what? But what he was trying to say is that I needed to stop being in such a nice guy all the time. I had to stand up more for what was best for me and that I had to make clear to other people what I had been doing. You know, that doesn't mean you have to be a jerk. They're nice sharks. But, you know, ultimately, you have to take care of you because nobody else is going to. So, step two, all right? You've considered the source. The, the advice kind of passes a quick laugh test, all right? Now it's time to consider the context. Consider the context of the advice and if it applies to your situation. I'll give you another example. Several years ago, I moved from the U.S., where I'm originally from, and I came here to the Netherlands, and I reside here to this day. And, I, frankly, I love it. I I think it's one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. And occasionally, I get an email from somebody in the States who sees what I did when I moved here, and they say, hey, that seems like a good thing. Maybe, maybe I should consider moving as well. I always tell these guys the, same thing, the exact same thing. I say, when I moved here, I had one laptop bag, two suitcases, and 14 cardboard boxes. That was the sum total of everything I was responsible for in the world. Some of the people, on the other hand, who email me, they have kids. They have a house, maybe a spouse, perhaps a pet mouse. I don't know. <laughs> and while you can move to a foreign country and succeed under those circumstances, Sean is certainly proof of that, um, you have to admit that it's a very, very different situation. And what worked for me might not work for you. So you have to take it with a, a grain of salt, perhaps. But that's a pretty extreme version here. Let's, let's try something more every day. What about when a boss or a project manager comes in and he says, hey, we've got this issue on live. It's, um, it's, it's really inconvenient and we need it fixed by the end of the day. Like, I don't care how you do it, just, just hack it up. Get it done, okay? Now, this won't make me any friends at a technical conference, but sometimes, sometimes, it's the right thing to do. Yes, if you have an issue in production, you should write regression tests for it. You should refactor to the root cause of the problem. You should talk to QA. You should find out how it slipped through the first place, right? I mean, you should do all of those things. But in the meantime, your server's on fire, and somebody's got to put that sucker out, okay? Now, the context is really, really important, and I think our industry is beginning to realize that. Uh, maybe in the old days, we weren't interested in the business context, or the business didn't deign to give it to us. But I'd argue that's changing. I'd say that techniques like BDD or DDD, they're on the rise because they're all about gathering context. And I would argue that some of the criticisms leveled at things like design patterns recently are because they're often applied without context. Now, ultimately, it comes down to that old saying, right tool for the right job. If I were to ask you, which is better for chopping vegetables? My shiny new chef's knife or a chainsaw? Keep in, well, keep in mind the question isn't which one is more awesome, Right? I think if we're objective about the matter, we admit that the knife is the correct way to go here. And while it's awesome to be right, it's equally important to not run around online complaining about chainsaws, you know, yelling, chainsaws are an anti-pattern. You know? <laughs> because I assure you, I'm speaking from experience here, when a hurricane knocks a tree down on your house, or the dead rives in their grave, <laughs> that chainsaw is going to start looking pretty sweet right about now. <laughs> it's all a matter of context. Okay? That brings us to step three. You've considered the source, considered the context. Now it's time for what's maybe the most difficult part of the entire process. You have to be open to the advice, even if you don't want to hear it. Consider the chainsaws of the field. If we were to go up to this guy and tell him, hey, seems like maybe that's not going the best thing, you know, like, like maybe you'd be interested in this new knife thing, it's, it's kind of made for chopping vegetables. Like nine times out of 10, this guy would laugh at you He'd be like, knife, Pfft. I read about that on Hacker News. It's a fad, you know? And besides, why should I bother learning knife? My vegetables are chopped, what's the problem? <laughs> okay? He's not interested in how do you chop vegetables because he already has an answer. You know, the question to him isn't how do you chop vegetables better? No, that's a totally different thing. 
Uh, my mom always told me, you're never gonna learn anything with your mouth open. And that seems like strange advice coming from a man on stage with a microphone, but it's a metaphor, okay? She's saying that if you approach every question somebody poses as if you have an answer to it already, you're never gonna pick up anything new. Unfortunately, this is something that we almost always have to learn the hard way, which is why I'm going to share with you now the single most humiliating story of my entire career. <sighs> Many moons ago, <laughs> I went and applied for a job at a really big, famous IT company. All right? If I said the name, everybody here would know who it was, techie or non-techie alike. And I was really nervous about it, but my friends and family said, you can do this, you can do this. And you know, I'd made it past the phone screen, and I was like, okay, so I'm gonna go. And they immediately like, locked me in this room with a whiteboard and this older programmer. And it became clear right away, I was, I was sort of out of my depth. He was like, okay, so let's imagine that we've got like seven data centers across the globe, and like one of them catches fire, we need to keep the data replicated, and blah, 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 under these constraints, and it's gonna do this, and then there's a, a rebel uprising in this country, I have to make sure the data's migrated, blah, blah, blah. How would you do that? And I was like, I have no idea. <laughs> He's like, okay, let's try more of a software problem. Let's say I have a set with a billion items and we want to calculate this law of Newtonian physics across this is the thing and under Owen time with this sort of thing and blah, blah, blah. How would you go do that in your size of a blender? And I don't know. I was like, I'm going to draw on this board with a crown? It's like, okay, let's approach this from the other end. Do you know what a factory pattern is? <laughs> All right, and that last one, that, that one really gave him pause, okay? And it like knocked his accent like totally out. He was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. Have you ever heard of this book, Gang of Four Design Patterns? He's like, no, I'm, so I'm sorry, I'm mostly self-taught. No one's ever mentioned this. He's like, well, what about Pragmatic Programmer? Ever heard of this book? I was like, no, sorry. And I had like a notepad with me, so I started jotting down the names of the books he was mentioned. And he mentioned five or six more, I wrote them all down. He's like, okay, here's what you do. Read these books and have a nice day. <laughs> now, I didn't walk in there feeling 10 feet tall, but man, when I left, I felt tiny. I was crushed, okay? <laughs> I, let's not sugarcoat this. I left a job interview with a reading list. <laughs> it doesn't get worse than that, okay? But here's the thing, I did. I did start reading those books, and I didn't understand them all at once, but I did, and I kept reading, and I'm still reading them to this, to this day, but as a result of doing so, I got better. I got a lot better, okay? And this turned out to be a pivotal moment in my career because this is when I stopped thinking of myself as a hacker who was just trying to sell stuff to put food on the table to when I started thinking of myself as an engineer who had problems to solve. And I would love, I would love to have that same interview again today because I'm pretty sure I would get the job, but mostly, I'd wanna say thanks to that guy for taking that time with me. And maybe I'd have some advice about interpersonal communication skills, <laughs> but mostly I would wanna say thanks, okay? Even this guy, even this guy who hates my guts for some reason has something to teach me. Too fast. I do talk too fast when I present, and I should work on that. What's up with the hat? Somewhat arrogant. I don't, I don't feel arrogant, but Maybe I come across that way. And if that's the case, I don't know, maybe the way I present myself is interfering with the message I'm trying to bring. And if that's the case, then I have to consider which of the two is more important. Uh, <laughs> you know? No, you have to be open to advice, even when you don't want to hear it. Bruce Lee said, do you know why this cup is useful? because it is empty. Step four. If consider the source, the context, you are open to the advice. Now you have to put it in practice. You have to use the advice. Otherwise, it doesn't mean anything. Okay? This is the quote that I found when I Googled for advice about advice more than any other. It says, advice is what we ask for when we already know the answer, but wish we didn't. And if you search your feelings, you know this to be true. Now, my family has their own version of this. 
you'll pardon the profanity. My grandmother likes to say, shit or get off the pot. <laughs> and my mother has her own version of this, which is, Ross, don't be a chicken shit. <laughs> All right, I'm, I'm not painting them in the best light here. We're, 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 they're wonderful people, we're just from the South. We have colorful expressions. We say y'all a lot, okay? Now, my grandmother here, with this expression though, is talking all about indecision and getting past it. And my mother is talking all about fear and conquering it because these are the two big enemies you have when it comes to putting advice into practice. And I don't have any like magical tip for you on that one because I'm still working on it, okay? I can tell you what I do, which is consider how I'm gonna feel about it on my deathbed. When I've got like six months to live, you know, how am I gonna feel about that? Will I regret this in 48.5 years, all right? And it's not an easy question to ask, but if you do it often enough, it becomes something of a habit. You know? And it will never become easy, but it will get easier. But the reason it never becomes easy is because one of life's great, great lessons that we all have to learn sometime. Everything, everything comes with a price. Does anybody know who this is? Yeah, who? The sushi guy. Jiro, yes, this is Jiro Ono. Uh, Jiro owns a small sushi restaurant in the basement of a Tokyo subway station. He is widely considered to be the greatest sushi chef in the world, maybe the greatest who's ever lived. He is a master craftsman. He was the subject of a documentary a couple years ago called Jiro Dreams of Sushi, because he does. And if you look at his, his food, you can only admit that this is absolutely exquisite. If you would like to eat at his restaurant, you have to reserve a year in advance, and it costs you $300 per person. He has many repeat visitors, okay? Jiro is amazing, and I highly recommend the documentary about his life. But he is exactly the type of master craftsman we should revere. He is over 80 years old, still making sushi every day. This is Takashi. Takashi is Jiro's youngest son. He's also in the documentary. And in there, he tells a story about his father when he was a small child. He says that on the very few occasions when his father would come home from work, like you know, on the seventh day on Sunday, before he would go back to the office, sometimes he would sleep in on the couch for a little while. And Takashi is three or four at this time. Uh, he would wake up, walk into the living room, and he would see his father asleep there on the couch. And he would immediately turn around and run screaming to his mother, Mom, Mom, there's a strange man in the house. Right? Those of you with kids can imagine how painful that is. Jiro's a master craftsman, but it came at the expense that his own son did not recognize him. That is a hell of a price to pay. Hell of a price. Now, this, this dynamic between you know, family and craft is the one we talk about the most often, but there are different kinds of prices, and I think one we don't talk about enough in our industry are the moral prices we pay. Uh, my mom always told me, you have to do what you think is right. Nathaniel Bornstein, one of the creators of mine, he has this great quote that I love. He says, no programmer would ever create a destroy Baghdad method. It would be unethical. We would create a destroy city method that you could give Baghdad to as a parameter. <laughs> you, you really shouldn't applaud for that because let's face it, it's true. It's true, all right? We would do that and I think like, the ethics of what we do are extremely important. And the, the, there are certain revelations in the last year that I won't mention in the microphone that have made this extremely apparent, okay? At the risk of sounding cheesy, yes, there is a dark side. It is a very real thing. And while they may have cookies, they might come at the cost of your soul, okay? Now, ultimately, though, the important question here is there's a price. You pay it or you don't pay it. Both are okay. Sometimes it's a bad deal. The important thing is that you choose whether you're gonna take it or not, that you don't just let these things happen to you. That is equally important. And then after you've made your decision, after you've put the advice into practice, always go back and say thank you to the people who offered you advice in the beginning. They may not agree with your decision, but I guarantee you they will respect you more for explaining it to them, and they will be more likely to offer you advice in the future when you need it, okay? So step five, all right? You considered everything about the advice, you're open to it, you put it into practice. Now some time has passed. It's time to go back and meditate on it. Meditate on the advice. Ask yourself hard questions. Did it work as expected? 
Would you do it again? Did you get what you wanted? Are you happy? These are important things to ask yourself because humans and badgers alike have this bad habit of moving the goalposts. And we do this mostly through a process known as cognitive dissonance. If you've never heard of it, it's this idea that maybe you have uh, two, or more two or more belief systems that like, they don't quite match up. There's kind of gaps in the middle. Uh, the most uh, well-known version of this, by which I mean the one on the Wikipedia page, is Aesop's fable about the fox and the grapes. Very simple story. This fox is sort of sauntering along. He sees this delicious bunch of grapes hanging over his head. He's like, oh, those look, those look wonderful. I want to eat them. But he can't reach them. They're just out of his grasp, and he tries a couple methods of getting them down, and none succeed. And eventually, he just, gets, he just gets frustrated. He's like, screw it. Those grapes are probably sour. I'm out of here. Right? And he walks off like a pimp. I don't know. Right? So, simple story. Now, here, the fox is confronted with two conflicting beliefs. First off, I want the grapes, but unfortunately, I can't have the grapes, okay? And this causes him psychological distress because he can't reconcile these ideas. Now, if you've never had psychological distress, I assure you, it's an unpleasant feeling. And ultimately, something's gotta give. Now, the fox has already tried to reach the grapes. He can't change that. The only mutable factor here is the fox himself. All right? He can tell himself, those grapes probably suck, they're sour, and then he feels better. The situation is bearable, and he can go on with his life. And if you're interested in words, by the way, this, is, this story is where the expression sour grapes comes from. But that's cognitive dissonance, dissonance in a nutshell. If I were to be a bit harsher about it, it is essentially lying to yourself so that you feel better. Okay? There is no magic antidote for this, I'm not a psychologist. But I can tell you that sometimes it's good to remember where you started. Maybe before you make a big decision, write down what it is exactly you wanted to get out of it, so that later you have no choice but to confront the difference between reality and expectations. Okay? You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a paleontologist. Instead, I became a software engineer, and I'm okay with that. But I do know how it happened, and that's important. All right? So being honest with yourself is important, because if you can't measure accurately where you're going, you'll never know if you've gotten there. But this isn't a license to just beat the crap out of yourself over and over again. Everybody tells us, don't be too hard on yourself. Great advice, great advice. I think it's important to begin any goal with a realistic expectation. I'll give you an example. When I moved to the Netherlands, I had to learn how to ride a bike. Everybody in the Netherlands rides a bike. I'm sure you've noticed. Okay? But very few people in the Netherlands ride a bike like Danny Macaskill. If you've never seen this guy on YouTube, he's amazing. He's one of the world's greatest freestyle, uh, freestyle cyclists. I, I love watching him. Right? Here he is riding his bike across a metal cable in a junkyard. Here he is jumping his bike between two trains of a car, uh, between two cars of a train. Right? Awesome stuff. Love the videos. Meanwhile, I'm happy to not be this guy. <laughs> okay? And let's face it, that's a realistic expectation. I never set out to be Danny Macaskill. I'm not really too interested in that. He worked very, very hard to become that good. I just want to get from point A to point B without a concussion. And I mostly succeed. Okay? Now, my girlfriend turned me on to this idea of SMART goals. Now, SMART is a system back from the 80s of five attributes carefully designed to form the acronym SMART. Okay? But it's, it's, it's a little cheesy, but bear with me. It's actually a really good idea. It says that any good goal all right, has five properties. First off, it's specific. Something like, I want to be a better programmer, it's not a very good goal. It's not specific at all, okay? Um, on the other hand, I want to reread Martin Fowler's refactoring, excellent goal, it's specific. On the other hand, it's also measurable. I can look at the page count of the book, I know how far I am into it. How do I know when I'm a better programmer? I don't. You know, and as anybody with a Fitbit will tell you, once you put something on a graph, it gets a lot easier to do, okay? Right. Goals should also be attainable. It should push you to your limits every time, just a little bit further, but it shouldn't be impossible for you. I can read Fowler's refactoring right now. I have the skill and knowledge necessary to do that. The art of computer programming, Godel Escher Bach, not right now. I don't have the math for it. And trying will probably end in failure and frustration. The goal should be relevant. I would love to be a master chef. It will probably not teach me much about object analysis. All right. And finally, the goal should be time-bound. It should have a little bit of a deadline, not to stress yourself out, but just enough to, to give you a little bit of motivation, so, also so you can do planning, okay? So that's SMART in a nutshell. SMART goals, really good system, highly recommend it. 
Right? Now this might sound like I'm telling you to not be ambitious with your goals, and nothing could be farther from the truth. Aim for the moon, all right? But do it in an agile way. Just like when we code, the goal should be continuous improvement, small steps always forward. And when you do that, you'll find that the small steps are easy. All you need is the drive to keep going. Some of you might be familiar with the concept of a tiger mom. It's like this, this specific breed of hyper-aggressive mother that forced their children into being like manufactured geniuses, okay? I don't have a tiger mom. My mom is way cooler and more mellow than I'll ever be, as all my friends tell me. But what I do have is a tiger best friend. My best friend's idea of advice is stuff like, you can do better. I'm like, at what? We're drinking beer. <laughs> He's like, you can do better at life, everything. You can do better. That's a bit of a high standard, but she's not alone in this idea. Does anybody know who this is? I had a hard time finding a photo. This is Christopher Alexander. If you're not familiar with him, he was a building architect back in the 60s and 70s, and he created this idea of a pattern language, which are a set of ideas that are the direct predecessors to the design patterns I mentioned earlier in the talk. <laughs> and years later, he became kind of a teacher, and he wrote in a foreword to a book about his relationship with his students. He relates a story one time about this teacher who, uh, about this uh, student who came to him, and she asked him to take a look at a project she was doing. And he said, he said, sure, sure, I'll take a look. I was like, Yes, this is, this is quite good, it's good, well done. But is it chartreuse? Is it as good as this famous cathedral? And she, and she says the student laughs at him, like she laughs in his face. And he says, and she says, no, of course not. That wasn't my intention. And let's face it, even if I wanted to, I could never be that good. And he writes about how this frustrates him. He says, that standard must be our standard. If you are going to be a builder, no other standard is worthwhile. That is what I expect of myself in my own buildings, and it is what I expect of my students. He goes on to say, gradually I show the students that they have a right to ask this of themselves, and in fact, must ask this of themselves. Okay? It is arrogant for me to compare myself to a man like Jiro, and in fact, that is an incredibly impossible standard. He has decades of experience. I could never be as good as he is, probably. But I do not think it is arrogant to compare my work to his work, not to glorify myself or make myself feel better, but to understand the shortcomings, understand what it is that separates good from great. In fact, I would go so far as to say it is a form of intellectual honesty. To compare yourself not just to the guy in the cubicle next to you, but to compare yourself to the biggest badass there is, because it's the, it is the truth. Somebody that good is out there. The danger of that is that you will become discouraged, and you should never let that happen. If it happens, it's probably, maybe, pro perhaps because you're letting your self-worth get mixed in with your work. And they are two different things. You are not your work. And if you consider a field where you have no emotional investment, like, you know, freestyle cycling, you know, do you look at that and get discouraged? Because I don't, I just think, wow, that's amazing. And we should try to have that with the kind of work that we see from our colleagues. That brings us to step six, all right? You've put the, the advice into practice, you meditated on it, now it's time to pass it on. Give it to somebody else. Some people say you should do this from the beginning. I always pass on good advice. It is the only thing to do with it, according to Oscar Wilde. But I prefer the med student version. Watch one, do one, teach one. Because it emphasizes the idea, you don't have to be a master in your craft in order to, to make a meaningful contribution to someone else. You just have to be one step further along the path. This is not a license to go around making divine pronouncements about how everything should be, though, mind you, okay? Start with small things, little things. I'll give you an example. I was at a conference last year, and there was a speaker who was about to go on stage and do his first big, big talk. Okay, so he was in the, the speaker's lounge the day before. He was asking for advice about, you know, how am I doing? What should I work on between now and then? And I noticed that when he was presenting to the rest of us that he kept staring at his monitor and not really like looking at the crowd, not connecting with the audience, which as you see has a definite impact on presentation skills. And I called him on it. I said, I had the exact same problem when I started. It's because when you rehearse, you just always stare at the monitor for your prompt. What you need is something beyond the monitor, something you can make eye contact with. Use a stuffed animal, that's what I do. Man, I didn't think the other speakers would ever stop laughing at me. They thought this was hilarious, okay? But I'll tell you what, the next day, guy came up to me in the hallway and he said, Ross, 
I went home, I took one of my sister's stuffed animals, and I did my talk to it. And yes, I felt like an idiot for the first 15 minutes, but you know what, after that, I see what you mean. It actually worked, thank you. But don't tell anyone, okay? Now, I wish I could take credit for this awesome, you know, training technique for speaking, but in fact, it's just a souped up version of rubber duck debugging, which somebody else taught me. And that brings us to an interesting property of advice. Advice is usually a short, pithy statement, right? It's a meme. Advice is a meme. And just like Dawkins writes, memes evolve. They change over time. They become applicable to other circumstances, or they become dual types and learn cool moves like fire blast. Okay? <laughs> so by passing advice onward to other people, you're actually letting it evolve further and furthering the sum of total human knowledge, which is a pretty noble goal. Just don't let it go to your head. Okay, today I'm in Amsterdam doing an awesome keynote to a crowd full of people in a great venue and that is sweet, okay? And tomorrow I will go home where I'm a man who does PowerPoint to teddy bears, all right? You have to keep this stuff in perspective, all right? Now, if that ever discourages you from doing it though, remember you are where you are because of somebody else. Somebody else helped you get there and you owe it to pass it on to the people who come after you. Just do it responsibly. We must be very careful when we give advice to younger, uh, to younger people, Dijkstra said. Sometimes they follow it. <laughs> that brings us to the last step in the process. You consider the source, the context. You are open to the advice, you put it into practice, right? you meditated on it, you pass it on. Hopefully one of those previous steps has changed your circumstances in some way, has changed your world a little bit. And that opens you up to the possibility of collecting more advice which is very, very important. Now, on a very, very practical scale, the best way to do this is through your work environment. You can introduce tools like code review, sprint retrospectives, 360 feedback, internal workshops. These are great techniques for collecting more advice from your colleagues. The main rule with all of these, though, is that you must make the participants feel safe, always. Sometimes I lead teams, and when I do, I have a rule about code review. You can say anything you want in a code review. That this code is bad, that it should be refactored, totally wrong approach, waste of time, anything you want. But the moment you make it personal about somebody or make it seem personal, that's it. I don't wanna work with you anymore and you're out, okay? You must make participants feel safe. And if none of these things are applicable to where you work, then ask, ask for feedback over and over again. Ask a lot, ask the the dumb freaking questions, as Rowan Muir would call them, because somebody's got to. Just keep asking until you're blue in the face, because this is the only way you're gonna collect more feedback, and that is an extremely important part of continuous improvement. Remember, one of the agile steps, evaluate. You have to keep doing that, okay? Now, there's a very interesting thing about advice. It's important to also collect it, because you never know what you're gonna need. When I was a kid, there was nothing I hated more than the expression, you'll understand when you're older. How condescending is that? I'm not stupid. You understand, explain it to me, and then we'll both understand. Right? And it pains me to stand here before you and say this, it's true. There are some things in life you only understand until you've experienced them, like your first heartbreak. Intellectually, you understand it before it happens, but nothing prepares you for the experience. Yeah. Uh, that's the crazy thing about advice. We always think we understand it when somebody first gives it to us, but we never do, right? It's not until like years later it actually unlocks and we really get what the person was trying to tell us. It's not until like decades later you're standing under the shower and then you're like, that thing my seventh grade science teacher told me, my God, it's full of stars, I get it now. <laughs> but that's the way it works. So under these circumstances, with these properties, there's only one reasonable thing to do with all the advice you get, which is stockpile the crap out of it, because you never know what it's gonna turn into. Right. I go to a lot of conferences, and last year when I was writing this talk, I tried to find developers over the age of 55, which turned out to be quite hard. But I figured it was worth a struggle, because I mean, come on, these guys should be the motherload, right? Experience, knowledge, they've seen it all. These guys must have great advice. Well, the creepy thing is I found three, okay? And they all independently gave me the exact same piece of advice. They said, find a mentor. Nothing in their entire career 
made as much impact on them as finding someone who was invested in their success and regularly gave them feedback. This was the most important thing they ever did. So take that for what you will. So that's about all the time I have for today. Let's just give you a quick recap one more time. When someone gives you a piece of advice, consider the source. Consider the person giving you the advice. Consider the context. Is it applicable to you? Be open to the advice, even if you don't want to hear it, especially if you don't want to hear it. Use the advice. Otherwise, it doesn't mean a damn. After some time has passed, meditate on it. Meditate on the advice and ask yourself the hard questions. And then finally, pass it on to somebody else. You know, if it worked for you, recommend it. If it didn't work for you, warn them off of it. And that should open you up to the possibility of collecting more advice, which as I'm sure you've noticed by now, just starts the entire process over again. You know, inception. Okay. I hope you've enjoyed the conference like I have. I've had a lot of fun here the last two days. It's been great. You know, and there's been a lot of great advice around here. I've really enjoyed picking up some new stuff. Like Matt says, know why you're here. Choose the right tool. Be more awesomer. Searching is fun. Don't be afraid. You can be trapped by decisions you make or didn't. Yo dog, I heard you like filter, so I put a filter filter in your filter so you can filter while you filter, all right? You don't know. You don't know. It's about how you got there. It's pretty much magic. And I'd like to think that I'm telling you, make your time count, because you will never have enough of it. It's been an honor to be here in front of you today, and I hope that you've taken time to listen to these people, collect advice, but I also hope you've taken the time to meet new people, not just speakers, but your fellow attendees. Because advice, advice doesn't come from nothing. Advice comes from people. It comes from things that they've experienced, things that they've learned, things that they've lived. And when somebody shares a piece of themselves with you in order to make you better or stronger, well, if that is an open source, I don't know what is. This talk is called Things I Believe Now That I'm Old. But really, it's kind of a crappy title. You know, I'm not old. And it's not about what I believe. It's not even about me. It's about the people. It's about the people who gave me advice and got me where I am today. And this talk should be about them. It should be called the people, the people I believe in now that I'm old. Well, older. <laughs> Thank you for your time. <laughs>